uh, a lot of like, climate modeling, some humanities work. So it's a very, very uh, big mix of people. Um, <clears throat> I probably couldn't have predicted that I would have gotten into like working at a, at a interdisciplinary group like that. Uh, I got first into this realm of temperature, uh, like what is it good for? Um, and it turns out like extreme heat and extreme colds are very bad for you. I have work looking at um, mortality. I also have work looking at whether or not when it's extremely hot out, whether you have a lower or higher chance of conceiving. Uh, and also on the other side of the reproductive health and uh, looking at whether extreme heat or extreme cold uh, leads to worst uh, birth, birth outcomes. And so that's, I think, why one of the reasons why I was particularly excited to talk about uh, this work here by Johanna, um, looking at how extreme temperatures affect prenatal health. Um, <clears throat> another reason why I got excited about this work um, is because I think there's a lot of potential for drama, and I love drama. Um, and I think here's one where we've got two models enter one model leave, like there's a battle between um, basic OLS with fixed effects and uh, causal forest, this machine learning. Um, and I intentionally use basic in front of there because I think people who probably like Taylor Swift uh, and like maybe like uh, pumpkin spice lattes also probably like basic OLS and I'm just speaking from my own personal experience. Um, um, uh, I will, you know, so I, I want to I wanna create a little drama there and just for us to think about like, what are the, what are the trade-offs and more like, like about our own subjective weights. Like, what do, what do I like? Um, and, and what do you think about comparing them? But I also want to think like, how can we better compare them? You know, basic OLS, it's great in the sense that, I mean, it's probably out of the can easier to use. Uh, that's, that's for one. Uh, but I also think that, you know, some of the, the assumptions and the interpretability of the model are, you know, nice and clean. And I think that, that you lose a lot of that with machine learning. So it's like, what do you gain? And then you, oh, you can predict better. And then my next question is, oh, really? So like, let's see, let's find a way to really quantify or at least get like apples and, you know I mean, like close to apples, maybe apples uh, and oranges as close as we can get um, to saying like, okay, like this is like the, some of the differences you would get between the two results. I'll talk a little bit more about, about that, that later. So trying to create a little drama um, and get your opinions and thoughts on this. Um, to warm up, I'd like to sort of make the case that, that temperature is an important thing for us to study, maybe as economists especially. I mean, we are good at causal inference, uh, but there are some like implicit e econ questions sort of lurking behind there uh, on top of the econometric stuff. Uh, so we're in LA. Um, today, you have about 60 days per year where the temperature exceeds 90 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm gonna talk about temperature interchangeably usually with like a hot day. So when I think temperature, I want you to sort of recenter around that, that we're talking about like the distribution of daily temperatures. Um, but you know, you care about whether it's extremely hot or extremely cold, this non-linear uh, temperature like health relationship. Um, we care about it, you know, because temperature extremes are frequent today, but they're also expected to become, you know, more frequent into the future. Um, so like at the end of the century, they're predicting at least the median model, median climate model predicts that it'd be like 90 days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a pretty big uh, increase. Uh, and so we'd want to know like, like if we were to understand the health costs of this temperature increase, could we like better like predict or better assess the price of climate change? And maybe like someday when a carbon tax comes into place, we can say like we had a part in that. Um, you know, I, I do think about that. And I also think about these models, like, so they, they get you a ballpark of maybe the, the costs of climate change, but they're probably an upper bound because we're all going to adapt. As the temperatures, you know, you know, rise, we're gonna change, you know, how we live, like where we live, maybe the insulation in our homes. Maybe you live in Seattle and you don't have an air conditioner, but then you buy an air conditioner. To me, that's a really interesting question. Like when, like, when do people adapt or why do, why do people adapt? So this adaptation cost, um, but even if you're like, oh, this, this stuff doesn't even like, matter like you, there's no way to know and assess like how a short term like climate shock is going to like our extreme heat and hot days are going to affect human health that doesn't translate to climate because climate's like an average and expectations and i'd be like okay fine but climate you know extreme heat is pretty common today so it's thought that about 5000 people die per year from extreme heat events so that's that's a pretty big that's a pretty big number so just understanding like extreme heat, just like we don't want to work on understanding the effects of pollution, I think are like in the same same realm of, of economic um, importance. Now, I was talking about mortality, but we're, we're 
on to birth, you know, pregnancy and prenatal health. Um, and I want to make the case that there's a strong biological link uh, between extreme, extreme heat and, and pregnancy, just like there's a strong biological link between extreme heat and, say, like the chance of a cardiovascular event. And this is, I think, a little less known for people. Um, so if you're pregnant uh, and you're exposed to extreme heat, uh, your oxytocin levels are likely to rise. And they know this from randomized control trials with sheep. Um, uh, again, something I'd never, literature I'd never thought I'd dive so deep into um, when I started an econ PhD. Um, um, but, but when the temperatures rise, what's the oxytocin, this, this love hormone like, like increases. And oxytocin um, actually is, is responsible, at least thought to be responsible for triggering labor and delivery. Uh, and so I have some research showing that when it's hot out like that day or the next day, you see a big spike in births. So what that means is like, say you were due to deliver like September 7th and it's really hot August 15th. Uh, and that means that, oh, maybe like that just cut your delivery, delivery date or delivery time down. And that means less gestation. So gestational length, and you probably heard the term like preterm delivery, like, and that seems, that seems bad. Like when babies come out like a little, little too early, um, they're sort of underweight and it's very risky, at least like it's, it's like hard to know exactly how risky because there's so many things going on. Uh, but it's thought that when children are gestating for shorter periods of time, that they have, it has lingering effects on their health. Um, and maybe one association study showed that like children that were born a little bit earlier, just like a week or two, um, had more asthma into childhood. Now that's not necessarily the only outcome you could say that temperature might lead to short-term birth, you know, birth implications. Uh, you know, it could, could also be like cardiovascular, like I said when I was talking about mortality, but it could also change people's behavior, like whether or not you go out for a walk, uh, maybe that exposes you to more or less pollution. Um, it could also have like implications for agricultural productivity. So there's, there's pretty compelling evidence that when it gets really hot out, that crops die. Uh, so that could be one way, although, you know, that's probably gonna have a more like delayed effect on people's health and welfare. Um, and we're looking at really kind of like nine months, nine months of exposure and how that it might, how, how that might affect uh, babies. Now, I want you to care about babies, but also think that that what happens to them like has lingering effects as well. So like maybe like in childhood, like I said, higher rates of asthma, but that it's also could be that maybe they just have a harder time in school and their just economic productivity is, is lower. So it could have, have long, longer run implications. That's a big open question. I think that yeah. there's one one study that I that I think that has good data to test that, but there's really a lot of scope for new studies there. So now on to what Johanna does. Uh, so she's looking at birth records from the U.S., which are fantastic, by the way. So if you ever want to get into like research on birth birth outcomes, the United States keeps excellent records back to 1969. Um, <laughs> But her, her records start from 1989 uh, and go to 2004. That's 2004 is usually a pretty common cutoff for, for these birth outcome studies because they start changing how they report a uh, state of residence. Um, but she's looking at how temperature during pregnancy, think you know, like nine months of exposure that starts at what's, what's referred to as the last menses. So, so pregnancies, a little more detail about pregnancies is that that when you think of measuring them, they usually measure them in the weeks for one. So if they're not nine months, they're usually measured as like 40 weeks. Uh, but two, they start the countdown actually at the time of the last period before somebody got pregnant. And so what actually that means is you're, you're actually not even really technically pregnant until you, know, you ovulate. And that's usually about two weeks after your last menses. So if you ever hear talk about like abortion bans and, and they're like saying, okay, like, we're gonna ban abortions after eight weeks. They're talking about women that have only been pregnant really probably just for six weeks. So if it got any shorter than that, they would be like, basically like they probably people wouldn't even, even know. Um, so Johanna, Johanna's um, assigning uh, temperature exposure. So like the nine months more or less um, af at the start of the last menses um, and then looking and assigning that based on the county of where the woman uh, gave birth, or actually sorry, the county that the woman says she's a resident of when she gave birth. And she asks a few big questions. Um, and I think this paper uh, aspires to do a lot. And I would say one of the things you want to have already talked about is maybe like trimming it down. And so I'm going to try to trim my talk down um, uh, as well. But she asked like, does temperature affect birth outcomes? Um, and are the effects heterogeneous? And this is where 
her, her impressive uh, skills, econometric skills and work on machine learning uh, come into play. It's really with question number two, like can we predict who's most, most vulnerable? Um, so let me get into the, the, the basics. Um, if I were to do this study and I, and I kind of have, like I would probably do something similar to what Johanna's done, which is I want to set up a model, a basic reduced form model that, that really gets us at how do unpredictable temperatures you know, fluctuations, how do those affect birth outcomes? And I would sort of implement that by adding like county by start date of concept, like um, start date of last menses fixed effects. So basically saying conditioning on like assuming some people are trying to plan their pregnancy and their the date of last menses is not ex totally exogenous. I'm gonna just sort of like factor out what we might expect the weather to be at that at that point in time, like at least for the nine months after the date of last menses. So to do that, you just put in county by calendar date, uh, fixed effects, and you have unpredictable fluctuations in temperature. At least it's assumed to be thought that people couldn't predict at that point. But here's a trivia question. So you thought that the OLS model was basic, but let me just convince you that it's not so basic uh, and ways that people can often misinterpret it. Um, suppose you, I, I told you that we're comparing two places, one that's super duper hot, New Orleans, and another one is San Francisco. And just because New Orleans has, everybody got air, air conditioning in New Orleans and San Francisco, nobody's got air conditioning, um, that the, the effects or sort of the dangers are 10 times as large in San Francisco that they are in New Orleans. Now, let's suppose I pooled the data and we estimated a model for San Francisco and New Orleans. Um, and, I, and I include city fixed effects. So we're essentially getting this, the same thing, but we're just pooling the estimate. Um, what do you think the estimated effect of one hot day would be? You know, would it be the average of the two? Would it be close to San Francisco? You know, B, like closer to New Orleans? Um, I think a common misconception might be, not for everybody here, but like a common misconception would be like the average of the two. Um, and this is where like identifying variation comes in, into play in, in an OLS model. And, really you have to work to kind of interpret the estimates a little bit. And I think that's something that people don't appreciate. And I think it could be cool to think about that as a jumping off point for machine learning. Um, so why you might get an estimate that's close to New Orleans. So let's, here's two different slopes, the dangers of a hot day, you get more hot days, how outcomes are bad. Um, and you see like, oh, it's really steep in San Francisco and kind of like flatter in, in New Orleans. Well, what a fixed effect does is just recenters and like, like captures deviations from average from the X and Y variable. And so what you do is you just like recenter everything around zero and you'd be like, oh, like if we put the two places together, we're, our estimates are really just being driven by the places that have lots of variation in the X variable, right? We can do this mathematically, but I like, it. I like to do it um, uh, graphically because I think it just sort of like pops. Um, <clears throat> so what that means for these temperature studies is and OLS is we're, we're often estimating the effect of temperature extremes on places that have AC already. Historically, AC adoption rates have been pretty steep in the Southern states. And so like almost everyone in the South has air conditioning at this point, um, as opposed to San Francisco and Seattle. And those are some like interesting test cases because if you don't have AC, you wanna know like, oh, are, how hard are those places gonna get hit? But our estimates aren't picking that up. I mean, you can control for air conditioning, you can interact for air conditioning, but you're still like, I'm still like, ah, oh, those places just still seem vulnerable. Maybe they just, everybody's got like a little tiny wall unit and they just don't even worry about it. Or they have, you know, they say they have air conditioning, but they don't even like know how to use it. Um, so that's, I think an interesting jumping off point for thinking about heterogeneity is like, we want to know these vulnerable places, but it's, you know, like, and so you'd think like, okay, is it like, is it, isn't the OLS giving us something that's like a mix of the two? You're like, no, actually it's really heavily weighted to the places that already have lots of hot weather uh, and, and not towards the places that are extra vulnerable. Another, another aspect of these temperature studies that I'll probably like kind of just hop over real quickly is that we often have like nonlinear um, relationships or we're thought to have like the U-shaped or J-shaped uh, relationship. If you ever see that people talk about it like that. Um, so you could estimate a model with a spline um, or you know quadratic, other 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 functional forms. I think the popular approach now is just to use bins. Uh, so this is one of the reasons why I love S OLS in this particular case is like you can put in all these bin estimates and like saying like hey like how many days do we have below thirty degrees? How many days do we have between thirty and forty? And then we can admit a few temperatures. 
Um, and then we could say how many days before, you know, above 90, how do those affect like a health outcome of interest? Um, and then it's just so nice and easy to interpret like each additional hot day relative to our admitted category, which is usually like 60 to 70 or 50 to 70, or just like, you know, ple like pleasant temperatures. Like how does that, that additional day affect our health outcomes? And makes makes these nice, pretty graphs. You don't have to like impose any functional form assumptions. Uh, yes, you're losing a little bit of power because you're not, you know, capturing all the deviations in temperature within each bin, but I think you, you gain in, in um, explanatory power, oh, rhetorical explanatory power. Um, so here's, here's, I think one of the answer to the first question was, do temperatures matter for birth outcomes? It's kind of been known in the literature, it's still kind of an open question, but here's Johanna's work. Um, and I just direct your attention to the bottom, um, the bottom coefficient here, which just shows you that when your average temperature is above 32 Celsius or about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, that you see worse outcome, and this worse outcome being birth weight. Interpreting this is a little bit harder because because Johanna um, actually transforms birth weight um, um, and adjusts it for a few things. But you can think of that as being actually kind of small effect. It's kind of it's kind of relatively small. Each additional day, um, ha but does but does lead to worse outcomes. All right. So if I were just to like take a pause and ask you this question, you're like, what would be the next question you want to know? Temperature matters. It's bad for you. Um, I'd say that, like, take a pause, think about it. You'd be like, okay, probably want to know, like, what does it mean? Like, is are they really worse off, or was it just like lost water weight? Like, what it like, what does it mean for that for that family for that child? And say, okay, I want to know medium and long term outcomes. That's big open question. There's one study I mentioned, uh, but I think another thing I would want to know is like, who's the vulnerable? Like, who are the ones that? Maybe we don't know like if they have AC, but there's no there's no AC data to tell if they're vulnerable. So we want to like predict their vulnerability. Um, and so I'd be like, yes, let's do that. And I'm a basic, so I would probably do something like this. Suppose I wanted to know the difference between like the disparities between uh, the black and white populations. I would say, okay, let's just add interaction term. So, and then that has a nice interpretability. You just be like, okay, sweet. I just look at beta two and it tell me, like I look at the, like the, the statistical significance and I'd say, oh yeah, they're statistically different. That's kind of nice and easy. You add up the, the two coefficients to get the, the total effect and you'd be like, all right, that's, that's pretty nice and clear. Um, you can also just simply just run OLS on two separate samples and I, and I love those approaches um, as well. But this, is be, this would be kind of like how I would do it. And you'd probably say like, okay, that's, that makes a lot of sense. You could care for like justice reasons that you want to understand like difference between black and white populations uh, because of his, you know, historical discrimination, slavery, uh, contemporaneous discrimination. You want to understand the, that sort of, those sort of disparities for those, that, that simple group comparison. You don't have to worry about blocking any, any like pathways through which, you know, like the, this effect might, might differ between the two. You just have one simple, simple split. But how would we do it the more complex way? How much time? How am I, how am I doing? About 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Good. Thank you. Um, well, first we thing we do is we go on YouTube and learn about machine learning, <laughs> um, which I am like fresh off the machine learning boat. Like I am talking like, like I've been watching YouTube videos for like two weeks. And, and like, I started just doing them out of order, which was a huge mistake. I was like, let's just get to the part about heterogeneity. And I was like, oh my God, what just happened? It's like, have you recalled what the, we were our discussion of trees? And then it was like 10 mile, like 10,000 miles an hour. I was like, what are you talking about? Um, so, so, but this course, the Stanford course I learned from, um, was Susan Athey is, is really leading the charge there is very good. Like it, it, like, and I could even, if you want, just email me and I'll be like, these are the lectures that I think that like really you watch and then you watch everything again and you watch like those two. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a couple, but, but one of the things she, she does is she's, uh, makes the case for this, um, um, these causal trees and then it'll kind of like those trees become a forest. But, but how a tree works and how it's implemented, it's, it's pretty cool. Like, okay, suppose, and, and the example she uses is like deaths on the Titanic, 
which I thought was like also a very creative example. Like, like it's like, oh, first of all, I have to get that data. And like, second of all, that's like pretty, that's a pretty good, good thought experiment. And she's just like, okay, can we use, use trees uh, to predict like who would die on the Titanic? And how a tree works is first kind of ignore the tree. And, and let's just talk about how the data look. Okay, so suppose you have an X variable, no, uh, two X variables. And the Y, the thing is like the things that put the intensity of that thing pops out at you. But in this case, it's a binary outcome of whether or not the person died on the Titanic. Um, and so red means death, blue means survived. Um, and X1 and X2 in her, in her particular example were the class of the passenger. So like first class, you like have the, the nicest spot like on, on the boat, you're not like deep in the underbelly and you get to the lifeboats faster. But X2 is age because the you know, women and children first. Uh, and so they're like, there's more, if you're a child, you're more likely to survive. But there's also these like complex interactions between the two. But there's a lot of like binary stuff going on there. But, it, but this, the story is, if you're trying to do a tree, you just basically illustrate your data. And you start making cuts. You make the first cut and be like, okay, if I cut the data here at this point, in this case it would be on the X2, uh, like at the 0.3 value, mm -hmm. like it explains the blue and red pretty good. If I can only make one cut. And then you're like, okay, now let's suppose I can make two more cuts because now the tree split out and you're like, okay, if I made two more cuts, like what would happen? Like how much, like how much explanatory power did I get out of that? And you're like, okay, and you keep making cuts. And what's kind of fascinating is like, you can cut a variable multiple times. Like you could cut class a couple of different ways. And you could say like, it, like class, like the like second class and the, like passengers with young, whether we're young children, we're more likely to survive. Um, but like, maybe it didn't matter if you were in third class because like everybody, was perished when there was in third class for the most part. So it did, like age doesn't matter there. It's just like, like very, very, um, kind of how you would think about things and the complexity of things. And it, and it divides it up like in a nice um, and somewhat nonlinear categor categorical fashions. Um, but in our case, you'd probably end up with something, maybe this is just totally hypothetical, is that we're trying to identify vulnerability to extreme heat. Again, because we don't have data on what kind of house people live in. We, wanted, we just want to understand like, could we predict who's vulnerable? Maybe there's a way that we can intervene in that particular case. Um, but you'd be like, okay, it looks like, you know, if we split populations on race, that the black population is more likely to be vulnerable and then you have the white population. And then you're like, oh, but if we wanted to add another layer to it, we'd be like, okay, like high school education, because that's sometimes available in the natality data. You'd be like, okay, without, you know, like without a high school degree or with a high school degree, you'd actually split the data up nicely too, but you're like, oh, that variable high school education doesn't seem to matter in the case of the black population. And so you'd be like, okay, this is like starting to explain the richness in a very complex way where signs can flip, um, they can, variables can matter in one way or another, not another. You don't even know what the cutoff points are, but the machine learning model will, will find those for you. So I think it just kind of like does, lets the data do the talking, which is so cool. Now, some of the finer points of this, this modeling approach is like, it's like, you know, like pretty, um, uh, pretty hard um, uh, in terms of implementing. I got a little confused in the, in the, admittedly in the, the YouTube, YouTube part of it, uh, but she's got an R package. So she just kind of like keeping like, I just use the R package, everything will work out. Um, uh, but basically like cutting the data in, in half um, and then taking half the data and using it to like test like what the appropriate model should be. So like kind of determine the different, different trees. Um, and then on top of that, you wanna to start to build into your algorithm, like a penalty, like a penalty function for overfitting. So every, like you can keep cutting the data, of course, you can keep cutting and next thing you know, in each box, like you'd have one variable. You're like, I predicted it perfectly. But then it would just, you would be like, it, you would just be like, okay, that's like how to, if I have an out of sample, data set, like I wouldn't trust any of those like really fine cut points. Um, so, so you do this and you like, okay, I got the tree. And the next thing you know, you resample both sides of it, the test and the actual data used to calculate vulnerability. And you keep kind of like rinsing and repeating you have lots of trees, you average them up, you got a forest. Um, and, and then you can, you can look at the heterogeneity in the impacts um, across all these trees. Now, from there, like, how do you explain what you found? I think there's like a ton of work here. Like that's just right, like you can just, there's just, if, if you get into machine learning, like, I think there's just like so much creative energy could go here to like, how do we explain our findings in a way that's, that's intuitive? Because when you have tons of variables, like you can't, you can't even map out all the trees very nicely. And even so it doesn't necessarily tell you something if a variable is at one 
branch and not another. Like you kind of have to see everything together. Um, so what, what is done is you look at the most affected groups and the least affected groups. So I call it like a 90-10 split. Um, but, but you look at the characteristics of the people like at the leaves of the tree um, and see like, okay, who's, who, who are the most affected? And like, if we just did some simple like demographic analysis, like who would you, who would you expect? Um, so it turns out, and to do this, you'd go to, go to Johanna's paper and you'd look at table six and you'd compare like the, the, the means between the most affected and the, the least affected. Um, um, and in this case, you end up seeing that, oh yes, like, like older mothers end up being less affected. Um, you end up seeing that, that in this case, um, black mothers are more affected than white mothers, or re like relatively speaking. Um, uh, here's where I want a little drama. Here's where I want the drama. Is tell me that you couldn't have got that answer just by running that simple, old, that, that simple OLS model where you interacted temperature or hot day with the race of the mother and tell me that those got you very different things. Um, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what, what's appropriate. I, this is my best stab at it, which is I just said, oh, maybe if we just take the percentage point difference in the population of the 10%, the 90, 10, and that and say, okay, 0.28 in uh, the most affected minus 0.11, the least affected, um, that is like a, like a 17 percentage point difference. Um, is like, and now we look at the difference in treatment effects and maybe we see, okay, like the treatment effects are 0.34 different. And you'd be like, oh, okay, yeah. So now the, the beta two we would expect would be something like two. All right, so just kind of like, I walked through that fast, um, but this is just, just like all flying by the seat of my pants. I'm not sure if that's appropriate, correct, but I just want to know, like, like it, did, you, did you win? We had to give up a lot of transparency and interpretability, but like, did we get a different answer? And like, why? Why did we get a different answer? Last thing, and this is just really steeped in how many times I've presented a paper on temperature, what is it good for? Uh, people always say like, like, well, temperature isn't climate. And I say, yes, I know. Like, yes, yes, you are right. Then, and then I always go, oh man, but like, it's, that's a good question. Like, what is climate? Like, man, what does it mean? And then I say, okay, well, how would you even define climate? I'm like, everybody's like, oh, there's average temperature. And I was like, that doesn't seem right. Like, oh, maybe the frequency of number, like days above 90. I'm like, that doesn't seem right. Like either, that seems too simplistic. I'm like, I'm like, there's gotta be, like, how do you even know it's 90? Like, what are the cutoffs to, for temperature when people like would think about like, what is a hot day for them? And how could we predict like what people think of as the climate? using this vulnerability analysis because that's sort of like the revealed preference like we could ask people but what this would be like what they revealed as the temperatures that matter for them and how they think about whether they should adapt or not um so i think like the big the big question is like what do those variables look like machine learning is great for pre predicting nonlinearity. so like what is the temp daily temperature that really matters um like also like like sort of the like serial correlation like number of like of days that are um, consecutively hot, right? Like if you live in a place that's ha every year has five days that are really hot versus a place that's never hot and all of a sudden it's like 20 days that are really hot, like that could matter differently um, for how people adapt. Uh, variance itself could matter. Maybe even the winter temperature matters because you're like, I can't afford to have like air conditioning and like a goose jacket from, you know, what is it, Canadian? What's, the, what's that Canadian goose? Canadian goose. Oh, yeah, literally. Canada goose. Canada goose. Yeah. He's had one of those. I was like, ooh, nice. Um, but then you see the price tag on it, and you're like, ooh, not so nice. <laughs> um, okay, so those are, those are my big thoughts. Let's get some drama in here, thinking about like how creatively we could come <coughs> at a back of the envelope cal calculation to, to show us the basics like me, that what you got was different, um, and the loss of interpretability is worth it. Um, and the second is, for the environmental economist in me, can you help inform the adaptation debate? Like, what causes people to adapt? Like, what real temperature that they're feeling makes it so, like, I can't live without air conditioning? I mean, we know it living in the South, but, like, like where was that cutoff? Where's that exact cutoff? So those are the, those are the two thoughts uh, leaving here today. Thank you.
much. First of all, Anna, thank you so much for this great presentation. I feel like if you're setting up a presentation course, I might be your first student. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like I learned a lot from that, um, especially this like non, let's say machine learning econ group point of view um, that I currently have uh, where I am. So um, I guess I wanted to address some of the comments that you had. So first of all, regarding like the as you from the battle of the model. So I think as you clearly pointed out, what we lose with this machine learning is definitely the interpretability. So the problem is that with the classic OLS that we're all used to, we have like nicely interpretable um, coefficients, which we definitely do not have anymore if we use machine learning. I mean, this is the one hand side of this uh, story. The other thing is that we, at least from my opinion, gain quite a lot. So I mean, we do not have to imp uh, impose any functional form anymore. Um, so I mean, if you would just think that in the basic OLS model, we just don't believe that the effect of temperature on any outcome is linear. So then we wouldn't just uh, look at it um, and we would not believe what we find. So I mean, this is cool with the machine learning that we do not have to impose any like linearity assumptions or anything like that. Um, but um, definitely, interpretation is something that people have to work on. So this is something that I'm also interested in, in how to make um, the machine learning things that we find better interpretable in terms of like communicating the results that we find there. So I mean, um, if we would compare the machine learning or like the causal forest with what you suggested, for example, um, compared to a simple OLS model and just do this like sample split with, for example, black and white, I think if we're interested in like the effect on like two or three different subpopulations, this might be something that we could do. But um, I mean, this machine learning gives us the strength or the ability to actually do that with the whole uh, X variables that we have available in our data set. And if we would do that, just split on like every X variable in the data set with an OS regression, we would run into some multiple testing problem. Um, and I think this is actually where the machine learning can help us to really identify in a like data-driven way, the variables that actually like are the sources of this heterogeneity that we find. Because otherwise, if we just would do it manually, I think that would kind of screw up our results in terms of um, yeah this multiple testing problem that we could run in. Um, and yeah, um, so I think regarding the two questions that are still up here, um, I think I actually have to work on this first. Uh, question a little bit more for the paper to actually show that um, the machine learning, I mean, either way, it gives us probably different results in some ways, but very similar results that the classic OS could give us in other ways. And I think this is something that I really have to point out, especially if I go to like this non machine learning econometrics audiences where people might not be too much interested in the methods, but maybe in the results. Um, so that I can convince them that the machine learning is actually something uh, that we can learn from. And I think regarding your second question, I think this is something I haven't really thought of, to be honest. Um, what I found out when I did this project is that it doesn't seem to be like a clear consensus in the literature about like, for example, temperature shocks or like what temperature is actually harmful. So, so this is something that I found pretty difficult because I mean, what I've been looking for is something like a definition of some, some kind of heat shock, like a binary shock, and I couldn't find that in the literature. So, so this is something that seems to be like still quite open. So probably um, machine learning could help for that. But at the moment, I'm not quite sure how to like use that to find like this measures of temperature that actually um, help to like look into this adaptation behavior of people, but I think that would be something to, to look into in the future. I think that's a really cool idea for future work. So thank you so much for your comments. It was really helpful. Questions? So I have, I have a question about that discussion of interpretability. Can you not get, can you not get treatment effects from, 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 from what? As he is proposing, is it is my understanding is that you can? My understanding is that you can get some like treatment effects there or like oh, sure, co -co conditional, sure. and that's very interpretable. I, 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 I'm, I'm fighting against kind of the idea. I think what you, I, I, 
don't know, I haven't looked at the paper very bad, but you can certainly get those treatment effects. And regardless if you slice it like a regression or slice it at machine learning, it's, sure. a, it's a treatment effect or even a conditional average treatment effect. So you get that. And then pushing a little bit about OLS, just kind of like to give you some, I don't know, ammunition if you wish. <laughs> um, one of the things that people have been doing a lot is, and Jeff Woolrich has done it a little bit, and it's like, okay, well, we want to get heterogeneous treatment effects. You start adding a bunch of interactions to your regression, mm -hmm. and the dimensionality of that object grows immensely, and it almost becomes like a non-parametric problem. So at the end of the day, they almost converge, if you wish, because if you really want to model that heterogeneity and get a treatment effect, you need to add a lot of regressors, and it becomes really heavy computation. So this also, so both things converge, and, and I think what you're doing is very interpretable, I guess. It's, it's, Oh, that's my interpretation, I, 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 but I don't know the um, parameters you're so, 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 using that method, I guess. Um, so I guess there are two sides to this question. So the first one is um, like what you said that, for example, which would do just um, like at all these interactions. Um, yeah, I think that's definitely a problem. So if you add like hundreds, thousands of interactions by hand, then I mean, then you probably wouldn't be getting any interpretable estimate anymore. Um, so this is where the machine learning comes in handy. So you really get the um, conditional average treatment effect for, for like, let's say each individual person there. The problem there is you get this estimate, but you still don't really know where heterogeneity is coming from. So, so this is, I think the big question. So, I mean, the prediction part, that's actually like solved <laughs> probably. Um, so, so you really get this nice prediction for every person, but I mean, then you have this individual and you don't really like, have an easy way to really find a pattern that's like explaining this higher treatment effect for one person that you find and lower treatment effect for another person who might be like quite similar in their characteristics, but you can't really like get uh, hands on why there is this heterogeneity. So you're getting the individual ones, so individual level, you don't group them or you don't find any other like a conditional. Um, so, so, so there are certain things that you can do. So what I do in my paper is actually, first of all, get the conditional average treatment effect for like the, the individuals. Individual, yeah. um, but you can also look at the uh, gates, which is like the group average treatment effect. So oh. this is where you get treatment effects for, for certain groups. But still for this gates, um, what I find problematic about these is that you still have like, depending on which groups you're interested in, like for example, black and white, you still have like quite large groups and then you wanna, um, you can compare their average treatment effects, you can do that. But still in this average treatment effect, there might be some strong heterogeneity that you can't observe with this uh, group average treatment effects scenario. Okay. I have a kind of a comment and mm -hmm. the question is, does it make sense? <laughs> Because I've kind of asked myself this question about some of the machine learning uh, techniques that I've used or read about is, you know, can you, do you really need the machine to do this for you? And so this, this is kind of my answer and you can tell me if it's incomplete or if it makes any sense. I mean, I think one thing is that you can very well end up with, like, just interact it with black and you get like what you need. The difference is that if I do that in OLS just by myself, like I'm coming in with a strong prior that this is the right way to do it. Whereas if I do it with the machine, the machine tells me that means I've actually kind of, in a way, rejected a bunch of other ways that it could go. So I'm letting the machine make this choice in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess if, if I were going to expound on that, I would say that, you know, sometimes I do want to, I do have a strong prior and, I, it's, and it, there is a specific thing I want to test, in which case I should use OLS. But in other cases, I'm a little bit more agnostic and I'd rather have the machine find the patterns. Does that make any yeah, sense? So, so I would definitely agree uh, that this is like a big point uh, why you would want to use machine learning over like this interaction, for example. So with this machine learning, you have this pretty much data driven way in finding um, like strong heterogeneity for certain groups versus, as you said, if I'm just interested in like some difference between some black and white people, um, then I would just run this regression with this strong prior that I have. But I mean, if I just let the machine do the work, <laughs> then um, I mean, there's like nothing as a prior in there. So it's actually like a data driven way that, that finds this. Um, it kind of depends on the, I guess the point is that it depends on the context because I think I yeah. have papers where I do so, have so, a, so I mean, for this project, I was interested in like, uh, um, like how this temperature affects health. And then, I mean, like, all right, I saw that there should be some, some negative effects of extreme uh, heat. 
But then, I mean, I was interested in, <laughs> is there heterogeneity? And I wasn't really having a prior on like some sort of how this heterogeneity might look like. And that's why I think this machine learning would be the suitable method to just look into that, yeah. So um, I'm going back to Alan's point about the fact that we actually do not know what about, what about the temperature patterns really affects health. So I know you have used only one of them, one of the 90 degrees above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. But I wonder if, if the answer to that question is not the supervised learning that you are implementing, but rather an unsupervised learning to really find patterns of temperature that correlates with, with bad health. Like for example, when we study an image, right, we do unsupervised learning to see if there's a tumor or not, right? And maybe that's the right approach to understand what about temperature patterns is really affecting health before trying to figure out what heterogeneity is in terms of who's affected or not. And I was wondering if you could talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, so to be honest, I haven't thought about it. Um, now that you raise this point, I think that might be something super interesting to look at. Mm -hmm. So thanks for this comment. So, There's a question in the front. Um, I, uh, so Nick, Nick kind of took my, my point, but I would just follow up with that by saying that um, in, in your previous paper last year and in this paper this year, uh, there's a common theme in that the things that kind of come out of the data-driven approach are things for which we might actually have a prior, um, like race and, and, in, in this, and the other one, the kind of maternal age being an important um, determinant uh, that interacts with smoking. So it, it, it seems like that's almost a way to pitch this, is that you know we all kind of have these strong priors about what should be interacted with our treatments. Uh, but this kind of says actually that these things like race and, and age, you don't need a prior, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? You know, like they come out of the data on their own as being very important. And, and that kind of just re reiterates the policy relevance of, of those things. Okay. Maria has a question. Uh, because so my question will be very different, not about the methods, but about your findings. And I'm wondering, and this is just my not being familiar with the whole temperature literature, like how do we know that this is about temperature having a physiological effect on people versus people doing different things when there is different temperature? So in this particular case, I guess we know that the physiology of like running around and going for a swim might potentially induce early delivery while staying in bed, you know, bed rest is frequently prescribed. It's probably more likely if it's super cold outside and you're just like at home drinking tea. So how do we know this is about temperature and not about what people do at different temperatures? Um, so, so this is actually a pretty good point. So um, the problem is like, I don't have like, any data on what people were doing that day, like on those hot days where those hot shocks occurred. So, um, I mean, that would be optimal. And then I could just tell you, like, if it's really something that's about the temperature of some sort of like different behavior during temperature. Um, at this point, from the data that I have, I actually, to be honest, I just can't tell you if that's something temperature driving some, some sort of behavior that I can't observe. So, uh, so I can only tell you something about the things that I do observe in the data. And it's kind of interesting, that. like how much of the heterogeneity is driven by people, different people doing different mm -hmm. things in response to different temperatures, like somehow knowing what people do to be super cold. Like yeah, 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 I mean like in an optimal world, I would like to have the data, but unfortunately I don't. So I think it would be super interesting to see. Thank you for your data. And then Percival has the last question. All right, so I just had a quick comment and then also a question. So the comment is, I think it's common that would, um, there would be a suggestion that we need to explain the sources of heterogeneity when we use this sort of complicated machine learning methods, such as the causal forest. But, you know, I, I like to always push back on that and think if you simply did an interaction with blacks, you know, you got like a, all the difference in black and white, uh, that's not explaining this, you know, the, the different results we are seeing for black and white. So the question about explaining 
the soil surface regenerative are not unique to this matter. So I think they say it's a reason to think that because they are more complicated that we need to offer some explanation for what the source. The source is the excess footing <laughs> and the ways in which uh, you know the authority will go about non parametry by splitting the sample to come up with those estimates. And my, my question there will be um, I guess you, you talked about multiple testing being potentially a problem with if you are doing things by hand. Is it your sense that that if you estimate this um, whole lot of conditional average treatment effects, that those are immune from multiple testing problems? Is that sort of what your sense would be from the literature? Um, so, so probably they're not immune from multiple testing problems, but I guess um, at least from, from what I know, it's, it's definitely better to estimate this conditional average treatment effects uh, from, from like this one model compared to like having Oh, 10,000 regressions added by hand. So if I could take you back and maybe I can connect some of the threads and I'm going to throw out an idea here for data you do have that I think could provide some insight uh, and talks, speaks to unsupervised learning. So you have every temperature for every day that this person was pregnant, yes? Mm -hmm. And that, in a regression context, you would never think about saying, let me just throw every, every data point. Right? That, but that's your space of data that you have. So if you do that, and it turns out that you know, in the south, when the temperature gets to 90 degrees, you don't see much effect. But when it gets to 45, you see big effects going the other way. right? Or, then, then you might be able to sort of tease out some interpretation there. Yes, the fact that you've taken what is actually daily data and then collapsed it into hot days or hotter days or not so hot days is very much an OLS driven or traditional statistics driven. I need to reduce my vector size. Right? But here you have the advantage of throwing the mm -hmm. whole thing in there and then seeing what comes out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so. I mean, the way that I put it in um, is currently I've tried different things, um, but I haven't thrown in like a daily data yet. So, so maybe that's something to look into and see actually like coming back to Alan's second point due to this, like, do we actually like know which measures of temperature are affecting health in a way? So, so I think this daily data might be a good approach there. Thank you. All right, thank you. This is a great discussion. Um, I'm going to move along.